Let me introduce you to a lot of the creative force behind this film. And just before I do, let me mention that American Hustle and the people I'm about to introduce have been nominated for several awards, including seven Golden Globe nominations for Tomorrow, a 13 Critics' Choice Movie Award nominations, two SAG nominations, and 10 British Academy Award nominations, and that's just so far. Uh, please welcome the writer, co-writer, and director of the film, David O. Russell. <laughs> and the great ensemble cast here, Bradley Cooper. <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> and Amy Adams. Grab a mic. Amy, let me just start with you uh, on The Fighter. Uh, you did a great job on that, and this role is extraordinary, as Sydney and Edith and all those incarnations that you have. <laughs> Thanks, guys. You guys are awesome. It's a, very, it's a very tricky role, but what was it that appealed to you when, when you read the script and knew you could play this? Well... Working with David, you don't always get to read the script before you agree to do the film, which is a really scary thing, but at the same time, you know, based on how he talks about the character, the investment that he makes in the details when explaining the script and the story to you, by the time you're done with the conversation, it's, it's not like, okay, why would I do it? It's why wouldn't I do it? Because he just really transports you in those conversations, and he did that to me with Charlene in The Fighter. He sent me one page and then said, but I have a plan for her. She's going to be tough. She's going to be deep, and you're going to get to punch, which was a big plus. But, but that's David, and so it, it all boils down to the relationship and the trust with David. That's, that's why people keep coming back and the characters that he develops. Yeah, and it's such a complex role, too. And, man, you look great in this movie, too. You get to wear all those great kind of 70s <laughs> fashions. <laughs> or barely wear them as it is. <laughs> was that fun? Was that fun to just throw yourself into this kind of a You know, period? by the time you get to filming, you're not even thinking about it anymore. So I wasn't self-conscious. But it was a lot of it, it was a lot of fun and it was really empowering and, and it was so much a part of the character's um, manipulation and it just felt so character driven. I didn't think about it until I saw the posters and watched the film and thought, oh my gosh. Um, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> but, it, but I really enjoyed it. it was a lot of fun. And Jennifer, uh, Rosalind, she is just a wonderful character. Co great comic creation. Um, and so, so different. You know, everything you do, you, I, it's, you're just a great character actress, even at, at this age. And I got to ask you about jumping in after Silver Linings Playbook, for which everybody knows you won an Oscar. And um, <laughs> jumping into this with the hair and everything, and she's kind of a loopy. Rosalind's a, a, a little uh, uh, unplugged. Yeah, she was an, an amazing character. Um, I first, David first started talking to me about Rosalind during the SAG Awards while they were announcing the SAG Awards. <laughs> um, and he was pitching her to me. And, and basically, David, if, if David calls me, I mean, it doesn't matter what he's planning on doing or what, it's just yes, before you read the script. Because working with him is an experience. And um, and then reading Rosalind and David and I would just get on the phone and we'd go on and on and then he'd you know show up to my hotel room and tell me I have this idea with her with rubber gloves and cleaning and dancing and it was just kind of this growing evolution. It was such a, it's such an amazing experience because Sometimes you read a script and you play that character and that's that and that's fun and that's great. But with David, it's just kind of constantly evolving. We just kind of do whatever we want. It's <laughs> awesome. There's so it's many so great scenes. And that the scene, I have to say, the scene in the bathroom between you and Amy. Yes. <laughs> Instant classic and so unexpected. I mean, I didn't know where that scene was quite going to go, but that was pretty wild. Can you share a little bit of how that happened, uh, the... That was Amy, Amy's idea. David came over to me and he was like, what do you think about kissing um, Amy at the end of the scene? And I was like, what? 
Why? Because I just thought like something had happened where we didn't hate each other, and then he explained it to me, and this like it's part of her poison and this and her manipulation. And Amy, like, you talk about it, it was your idea. Yeah. yeah. But you did it so beautifully. And well, thank you. Yeah. It um, was a beautiful idea. It was. Well, thank you. <laughs> no, I just my character at that point is so angry and so desperate, as we all are at that point, that I was like, why would I let her leave? I'm not gonna let her go back out there until I feel like I've gotten through. It doesn't matter how crazy she gets in my face, makes me cry, why would I let her leave? And I was like, what's the craziest thing she could do? And it just, I was like, that's what came into my mind, so. But that's what's great about working with David is I can bring a crazy idea like that and say, what if, just hear me out, what if she kissed her? And David was like, huh, let me think about that. And then he's like, Jennifer's game, so. Um, and she did it great because it never, it felt so organic and so in her character and uh, the whole way she did it just was, David said it like this and I'm going to steal it, it's a toxic punctuation to the conversation and it's, she does it beautifully, so. And just to add to that real quick, that thing, hi, how are you doing? Hey. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> am, I, am I late? <laughs> It's kicking in, Jen. It's kicking in. <laughs> um, sorry. All right. Anyway, back to this. Um, I just want to just want to say that uh, the thing that makes it so great uh, in terms of not just sort of just being just like this kiss in and of itself is that you then go out in the in the hallway and you fall apart, and that's when you realize like, oh, this was her last move to try to one up uh, Edith, and and so it, it all makes sense. In but it really makes sense when you see her fall apart a couple moments later, and that's the idea just about. You know, you, you, you're always free to have these ideas, then he's able to put them in the context of the story, and then it, then it works. And that's the reason why it works. And that's what's exciting about, for us, because we say, what about this, what about that? And then all of a sudden we watch it go through the matrix. And then he says, yes or no. And then if it's a yes, you see why And when you watch the movie. And that's sort of the exciting thing. And the, and the style that David employs in the films, in Silver Linings, certainly, and in, in Fighter, and in this one, that 360 degree, it's, it's kind of like doing a play, I would imagine, in some ways, for you guys, with the camera at all angles, and you're, you're on the entire time. Yeah, a play if it was in the round and people were everywhere. Yeah, yeah. because uh, it, it's, there's no proscenium, it really is. Uh, but, it's, but it's not like it's arbitrary. I mean, it's all blocked out. He just likes to have the room to be able to do that, and to have the space to, to let, whatever spontaneity occur, but it's not like you're just sort of randomly walking. He just likes to be lit so that he could feel it out and he gets the actors in the space and then let's figure out where it is and then we shoot it. And once we get it, there's, it, it's, it's always alive, so there is no such thing as it's just gonna be your close up now and then we're gonna switch and turn the cameras and relight. It, you, could, you have to be ready at any time for the camera to be on you. That's very exciting. It's like being in a classroom where the teacher's one of those people who calls on you instead of you raising your hand. You know, you do read, you do your homework. Then I, I did. I don't know. It's you know, when you know you don't can't fall asleep. <laughs> Am I, is this working at all? This connection. <laughs> I was like, what's he saying? But it's very exciting to know that uh, you know you're you're always potentially going to be, you know, the the focus of the scene, no matter what's happening. Is there improvisation on the set, or is it all basically it, there is? Yeah. Well, I, can I answer that? I'm on a roll. <laughs> you got it. Welcome to my uh, Q and A. <laughs> Maybe you answer that. <laughs> oh, I just, because this word improvisation is always thrown around, and, and, and I, I don't really think there's a lot of improvisation at all. I think the improvisation does not mean, is not what happens here. What happens here is he writes while the camera's rolling. He literally writes dialogue for us to say while it's, while it's rolling. And then he also allows us the freedom to, if there's a, a, a rhythm that's working, go with it as well. But we also will stop, you know, talk about the scene, talk about how we could change it, and then we go back and do it. And that's not really improvisation. So, uh, you know, that's one of the beauties that he's a writer who writes while it's happening, which but is you've But you've also written it 20 times before you get there. Because I have conversations with each one of them, <laughs> like Amy said, and I, it's my privilege to write for each of these actors because they inspire me. And I know that they're chemical. They're like, they're like nitroglycerin. So I know when I create for Amy, I know something's going to happen, something very alive and intense. And I know she can play three characters in one, and it's going to be weird and interesting to see her struggle with that. Um, and it was very brave of her to do that. And they all were very brave, because I'm asking them to take leaps before the script is finished and say, take a leap with me, and their trust means everything to me. So let's talk about Richie DeMasso for one second. How about this guy's transformation for five minutes? And this guy, this guy, was, not, this guy was nominated for an Academy Award, 
And with all due respect to Daniel Day-Lewis and Abraham Lincoln, I'm sorry. I'm just too, it's too bad. You it's always too bad. do this. It's You're such bad. a you know stage what? mom. This is why I'm a you father. A I'm the father of the movie. And I got to say, this kid was fantastic last year. And I, I put him up against anybody. And that movie's going to hold up for a very long time. And I, you know, and I, ne I rarely say that. And I, you know, the last couple of movies are going to hold up. And this one, too. So this guy transformed completely into somebody that was very volatile and unpredictable, childlike, yet very innocent and, and romantic, too. He falls in love with her. And, and it could be real at several moments. For me, there's real movie moments where it could be real for them, yeah. where, where Ella Fitzgerald comes in or they're in the disco. It, it, that's, that's important. It's not all a fake. And she's like, Jesus, I was faking it, but now I don't know for about five minutes, you know? So yeah. that, that's how life is, you know? And then he gives the wrong answer when she reveals herself. But, the, but his transformation is remarkable, and they all make it look easier than it is. That's what we want to make it seem like we happen to capture people like in a reality show. But that takes a lot of effort. Well, you know, and I, I, let me talk about your story a little bit, too, because this, this started as one kind of, as they call a procedural. I, I think the ab scan and the sting, it was a more of a serious thing. You came in and took the script and made it character driven. You made it these, these roles that these actors would just kill to play. But talk about your inspiration in taking this story on. And I love the first line in the movie where it says, some of this happened. <laughs> you know, it's not totally driven by the truth. It's driven by the characters and, and that interesting dynamic between them. Well, you could say that about The Fighter as well. You, know, you take a story like The Fighter, which is real people we got to hang out with, but you know, we had to take liberties with the story to, to craft it. And you, know, you could pick a story about Dickie that would be an extremely dark art film that would play at Sundance about a drug addict. I didn't want to make that movie. You know, or about, a, about a, you know, a very angry woman named Charlene who used to be a high jumper. You know, or a, a mentally ill guy. You pick the movie that you want to make that has the most hope and enchantment in it and as well as struggle. And that's what makes all these characters so amazing to me. My greatest goal when I create for any of these actors is what uh, John Petroselli, who runs a construction company in Long Island, that's the audience I'm reaching for, he came out and he goes, wow, that was great. It went by in about 15 minutes. And um, I wanted to spend more time with those people. And that's my wish when I write for all that. I, want, I have to have a lot of love for each one of the characters. I've completely forgotten your question. And was there, was there, was there, was there? I was saying how was great there your a script was. Was, was, there a <laughs> was there a question in there? What was the question? I, I got to ask you two. I got to ask two <laughs> things I know the audience is thinking of, and then we'll, we'll get some questions from the audience. But one is Jennifer, live and let die. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That is a, an example of this movie. You're all taking risk. You're all, you know, trusting your director, but you're really going. You're going for it. And I, I love that scene. I still had some dance moves left over from Silver Linings. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that, come was, that just that was David just came into my hotel room and said, "I have a vision of you in yellow cleaning gloves, dancing around, singing the Live and Let Die, cleaning the kitchen," and I was like, "Okay," um, and then. It was funny, like on the day, everybody was like a little bit nervous because we didn't know exactly what the blocking was going to be, and I didn't know what the blocking was going to be, like until the music started going, and um, and then we just called action, and then I don't know, I just started shaking my head like crazy, and <laughs> I thought there was going to be a lot more kitchen actually cleaning originally because I love cleaning a good kitchen, um, <laughs> but then like the music started, and then I just started moving my head a lot. Yeah. Dun -dun -dun. I love that your son's just watching it, too. That's the best part. That is the best part of the entire scene, is you're watching all of this, and then you turn around and you see this little five-year-old that's watching this whole thing, just on the couch like that. That's the most genius thing I've ever seen. <laughs> but, you know, you have to trust your instincts when you're writing, you see. And when you're writing for people who you've writ worked with before, you see, you see Amy in curlers, you see her being really gorgeous and glamorous like Brenda Starr, but you also see her being really raw and intense. Like some of my relatives, when they'd walk around with their curlers, and you're like, what's happening? You know, and they're crying, and, and they're crying and yelling, you know, in their curlers. Are you talking you know, about Amy or Amy, Bradley? Talking about Amy, talking about Amy. Pete Hammond, slam. That is the best. I'm going to put that. That's one of my favorite phone calls in cinema, yeah. the romantic phone call with the two curler wearers. <laughs> it takes a pretty awesome guy to walk around in pink curlers, though. He yeah, you gotta, you got to say, why wouldn't you just perm your hair through the whole thing? You did this every day, right? Two and a half hours? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, yeah. 
But that was because we, we wanted to test it out. We, we wanted to do with the guy, have the, the guy have curly hair, but we put on a bunch of wigs, and it, looked, it just didn't work. It looked a little Three Stooges-esque. So we thought, let's curl it one day, because you can't perm it and then decide not to do it. So we just curled it like that one day, and we kind of fell in love with it. And we thought, hey, this is what he does. And um, Cause every, the movie's about what everybody does to create themselves. That's really the theme, you know, the picture. And what are they like when they're off stage? What are they like when they're on stage? When they say this show isn't working for me anymore, I want to try to change shows. It's very hard for me to change shows, as, as Jennifer's character says. So Richie, we saw Richie behind the scenes, right, with his yeah. mother. With his mother. It's great. Now, unfortunately, we do have to wrap it up. But um, uh, they've got to be somewhere else. I know, I know, I know. But hey, wasn't this fun? Thank you so much for coming. Thank guys. you. Really, thank you for coming. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>